Good morning or good afternoon to you, depending on uh, where you're, you're located this morning or afternoon. Uh, my name is Vanessa McDonnell. I am the co-director of the U Ottawa Public Law Centre, uh, one of the uh, co-sponsors of, of this conference. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today for this panel on unity and diversity. Um, I'm joining you this morning, or I guess now for me, it's the afternoon from uh, the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. Um, I acknowledge their longstanding guardianship um, of this land and their, their continued care for it. This morning, we have three speakers joining us, uh, all of whom uh, have interesting things to say about the theme of today's discussion. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Mary Liston, who is an associate professor at the Allard School of Law, the University of British Columbia. Uh, today, Mary's going to be speaking about Canada's ancient constitution, a constitution old and new. Uh, we also have Colleen Shepard, who is a professor of law at McGill University, who will be speaking to us today about patriation paradigms, sovereignty, power, and rights. And then finally, we have Dwight Newman, who is a professor and Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Rights and in uh, in constitutional and administrative law at the University of Saskatchewan. And today, uh, Dwight is going to be speaking about whether Canadian constitutional law is Canadian. A very provocative title that I'm sure will generate some interesting discussion. Uh, so the way this panel is going to work today is that uh, each of the speakers will speak for uh, an allocated amount of time, and then we will have lots of time left for questions at the end. So I'll moderate the discussion uh, at the end, but I would uh, offer or I, I would um, invite you uh, if you have questions as they come up to put them into the chat. Uh, and that way, when our question and answer period starts, we'll have some questions uh, ready to go. And if not, I, I certainly will have some questions for our speakers. So uh, without further ado, Professor Liston, would you like to get us started? Thanks, Vanessa, uh, and thanks also to the conference organizers for putting together uh, this conference uh, and this panel uh, to uh, reflect on uh, our anniversary of our uh, newer constitution. Um, as uh, Vanessa says, or said, I'm uh, working with an idea of, it's in quotes, Canada's ancient constitution. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about, and I think what all of us on the panel are really uh, grappling with is pluralism. Uh, uh, and so maybe we'll be speaking more about a, a diversity rather than unity on this panel. Um, but what I'm going to talk about builds on an article that I wrote in response to uh, Jacob Levy's lecture on the separation of powers at the Center for Constitutional Studies uh, uh, last year on the separation of powers. Uh, and I examined uh, the jurisprudence around the separation of powers principle um, in the case law. Uh, and uh, discovered that there's not much to be said about it. Uh, but in the process of that, across the patriation reference, uh, which uh, was working with an older notion of uh, mm, a constitutional principle called uh, the mixed uh, constitution or mixed government. Uh, and so uh, I contrasted mixed uh, constitution with the separation of powers in that paper uh, and I'm picking that up again and working more with the mixed constitution principle uh, from the patriation reference uh, in this paper uh, for this panel. Uh, and what I hope is that one can um, bring it into a modern uh, constitutional uh, context. Uh, and uh, uh, my uh, suspicion is that it uh, provides a better lens to talk about the various um, pluralisms that are part of our Canadian constitutional order, which includes legal pluralism, political pluralism, and social pluralism, uh, as well as different ways of describing the dynamics of formal and uh, informal power in our constitutional landscape. Uh, and so I, I quote Dennis Baker uh, talking on the contextual nature of constitutionalism and how different elements bridge the distance between the constitutional uh, uh, forms and formality and actual political practices. Um, and it's this uh, link between uh, uh, the dynamics of informal and formal power, as well as the social nature of the constitution that I think the mixed constitution, the concept of it, uh, better captures 
Uh, but I'm ultimately not arguing to bring it back into the jurisprudence, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, what I'd like to do is, is to suggest it could be linked uh, with the notion of constitutional dialogue, uh, and that would be dialogue uh, in an institutional sense, institutional dialogue, as well as amongst societal actors. So some of you may already know about the idea of uh, the mixed constitution. It, it comes out of uh, Aristotle's politics. Uh, where I started uh, and where Professor Levy started uh, was how it was picked up by Montesquieu in Spirit of the Laws. Uh, and he combined this older idea with the principle of the rule of law, um, through which he redescribed the existing English constitution at that time uh, and uh, was able, through that fusion, uh, to provide a foundation uh, for a new concept, the separation of powers, uh, which then laid down a foundation for the idea of judicial independence as a defining feature of a constitutional order. Um, in Montesquieu and in Aristotle, uh, the separation of powers uh, was associated uh, with three divisions, uh, which mapped onto traditional classes or social orders, so monarchy, aristocracy, uh, and the demos or the commons, uh, and uh, each institution reflected one of those social classes. And so we can see that very clearly in uh, British constitutionalism with the crown and the monarch, uh, the House of Lords, which originally was an amalgam of executive actors and then in institutionally bifurcated to become the executive branch and the judiciary as a separate institution. And of course, the House of Commons or the legislature. Um, and so it was this emerging independence of the judiciary in uh, the English system that Montesquieu saw as a defining feature of that constitutional order. Um, out of uh, Montesquieu, uh, both Professor Levy and I um, uh, uh, identified several important premises and prescriptions around the separation of powers. Uh, that power should never take monopoly form, because that's always inimical to liberty. That constitutions both facilitate and constrain public power. Uh, that public power should be distributed to institutions uh, with a constitutionally uh, guaranteed independent, independence and base that overlapping powers are actually permissible amongst governing institutions and actors, so long as they don't violate the first three points. Uh, and that power comes in a variety of dynamics. Uh, and so it's not just uh, separating and there's balancing, there's checking, there's constraining, there's enabling, there's sharing, there's pooling, there are a variety of dynamics. So I contend, uh, as do some others, that um, this understanding of, uh, of the constitution, the separation of powers and the mixed constitution was part of the contextual backdrop to our first constitution of the British North America Act. And of course, in its simple scheme of government laid down in parts three, four, and five, the executive, the legislature, and, and the judicature. Um, uh, I looked to David Schneiderman uh, in his book, Red, White, and Kind of Blue, uh, where he talks about um, the fiction of the separation of powers. I don't go quite as far as that. Uh, but in reference to uh, the fiction, he, uh, he claims that um, though a version of the separation of powers admittedly lurks in the background of Canada's parliamentary tradition, uh, the separation of powers is subordinate to other dominant tropes having to do early on with mixed or balanced government and later on with responsible government. Uh, and so I picked up on that. Uh, and, and, and what I said in my paper was how, um, you know, Canada is always caught in the middle between its cousins. Uh, the louder British and American cousins. And so um, while we don't like Britain disavow the separation of powers, we don't really develop it very much in our jurisprudence. And of course, it's constitutionally significant. Uh, nor are we um, like the Americans, where we insist on you know, a full separate uh, and independent uh, notion of uh, the separation of powers with respect to the three branches. We're somewhere in the middle. And we're still developing it. So while the separation of powers is arguably explicit in the 1867 constitution, um, uh, and despite uh, Professor Schneiderman's uh, uh, contention that the mixed constitution uh, was a more dominant trope, uh, I actually think it's probably better understood as something that's implicit in the 1867 constitution. Uh, and so as always has to be brought into existence through the preamble and through any interpretation of constitutional norms and architecture. To back up that, I, I, I note that the only time that the idea of the mixed constitution or mixed government appears uh, in our jurisprudence is in the patriation reference. And so this conference is an opportunity to think about that in the patriation reference. Uh, 
Uh, and it occurs in the part of that reference where uh, the judges agree about the essential nature of constitutional conventions. And so it's through the discussion of constitutional conventions and then through unwritten law that we get the idea of uh, the mixed constitution. Um, and there's a long quote, and I won't read it. I'd hope to pop it into the chat so that you guys could see it, but that wasn't possible. Um, but a couple of uh, points uh, about conventions. Uh, so in the quote, that they reference. Uh, uh, conventions are understood to be found in all times and places. Uh, and I emphasize where the powers of government are vested in different persons or bodies, where in other words, there is a mixed constitution. Uh, and then there's a quote from uh, uh, Edmund Burke, uh, the constituent parts of a state said Burke are obliged to hold their public faith with each other with all those who derive any serious interest under their engagements, as much as the whole state is bound to keep faith with its separate communities, necessarily conventional rules spring up to regulate the workings of the various parts of the constitution, their relations to one another uh, and to the subject. And then as I say, the next uh, stage of discussion is, is, a, is um, an explanation about how all constitutional law doesn't take a positive or written form, which may be surprising to many Canadians, that important parts of the constitution are nowhere to be found in the law of the constitution. So what I wanna suggest, um, um, doing obviously um, uh, a fairly uh, heavy reading of that quote, is that the Supreme Court engages with the concept of a mixed constitution in two ways. So it's evoking this uh, philosophical tradition of Aristotle, Burke, and Montesquieu, uh, and it's informing our own constitutional order. Uh, linking it to fundamental principles like the separation of powers, the rule of law, and it's not rejected as a core concept, it's actually accepted uh, in, uh, in reference to its link to conventions. And then secondly, um, through this quote from Burke, uh, it, it explicitly uh, acknowledges our constitutional order as, a, as lying in between um, written and unwritten law, of which I think uh, the mixed constitution uh, exemplifies uh, the complexity of our um, the formal system of law, uh, and that uh, our constitutional order includes not just institutions and political actors, but uh, other constitutive actors and communities. And I know this is something my other uh, panelists will be talking about. But they do detach, the Supreme Court detaches it from the older understanding with social classes uh, uh, that were uh, fundamental to Aristotle and Montesquieu's conceptions. Uh, and instead sort of abstracts it to a plurality of persons, institutions, and offices that exercise government power for the public good. And so this is a classic liberal uh, spin on uh, the mixed uh, constitution. Um, and so I wanted to bring that forward and recast uh, the mixed uh, constitution uh, into a modern context uh, and uh, link it to uh, how we might understand and describe uh, uh, power dynamics in our constitutional order uh, and bring forward the social element, which some liberals might consider to be uh, illiberal um, because it's a more communitarian understanding of our, our constitutional order. Um, and that enables us to have a socio-constitutional uh, interpretation of our constitutional context where there are a variety of actors and classes, some of whom possess unique constitutional status. And obviously this conference is talking about the two main ones. One would be uh, the, the imperfect recognition of Quebec as a distinct society, as well as the emergent federalism that requires recognizing the unique status of indigenous governing bodies. So what I do with the mixed constitution principle is I recast it in two ways. Uh, the first is linking it to the idea of informal and formal dynamics in a mixed constitution. And I would note that our, our, our uh, earlier panels, uh, Justice Monaghan and also Naomi Metallic talk about this, these kinds of formal and informal dynamics. And then the second recasting is about this idea of an illiberal mixed constitution uh, and its link to Canadian society. Um, so part of this is a reflection on how the separation of powers principle is a really um, skimpy principle, uh, uh, despite its uh, fundamental importance in the 1867 constitution. And obviously, the uh, uh, increased import of an independent ju judiciary under the 1982 Constitution and the entrenched Bill of Rights. Um, but the separation of power uh, um, doesn't say very much. It says uh, nothing uh, about any particular institutional model. 
Um, it doesn't actually necessarily suggest that there's a bright line division about any separation between the branches. Um, it, I, and uh, like many others who are re-examining the separation of powers principle, uh, generally suggest that it recommends a general division of labor among the branches. It uh, acknowledges shared functions uh, between institutions as legitimate and possible. Uh, it recommends supplementing institutional design with appropriate counterbalances, both in encouraging action where needed and negative and constraining action where action is inappropriate. We sometimes understand that as checks and balances. Uh, and that this understanding, this more um, contextual uh, and less rigid understanding fits with the idea, older idea of a mixed constitution. Uh, but it, if we, um, so we may um, expand our understanding of the separation of powers to provide a better uh, description of the institutional relations, particularly in a Westminster system. Um, but it may have normative purchase as well uh, to get away from the kind of bright line understanding of the separation of powers. And as the quote from Burke uh, says, um, the mixed constitution, unlike the separation of powers, but we can use the mixed constitution to inform that concept, links together several fundamental principles um, that together create and undergird a kind of constitutive public faith, uh, a constitutional faith. Uh, part of this is uh, in the role morality of actors who are held to account. Uh, as well as institutions that can harmoni harmoniously cooperate where possible, uh, as well as uh, provide effective oversight, that checking function, uh, uh, and that this is an aspiration, obviously. And so when you hear it described this way, I hope you can see where I'm starting to make the links to, uh, in our jurisprudence, the idea of institutional dialogue uh, or constitutional dialogue. Um, so if we think our constitutional order is a mixed regime invested with the separation of powers, we would think of our constitutional landscape as a network of rules and principles that ensures that power is not concentrated in one branch, that this network is flexible and fluid, it's not rigid, it's not consisted of silos and bright lines, uh, it allows power to be facilitated, but also separated and checked, balanced, pooled, shared, overlaps. Um, the point is to provide an accurate description of that power, its use, and then to take a normative lens in order to provide a prescription where there are problems with uh, separation or balancing or pooling or sharing. Um, and that the separation of powers principle on its own doesn't provide a lot of assistance for that kind of work. Um, the older elements of the mixed constitution, uh, which come together in parliament, as I said earlier, um, each serve as a mutual check and balance upon each other um, and recommend uh, that each branch is a necessary cooperative partner in the mutual enforcement of the constitution, that's dialogue, so that it is not just one branch alone or not one dominant branch. Um, moreover, each actor's jurisdiction and authority should be constitutionally protected from the other and each actor should be answerable to the other. Uh, and so this ties into the idea of public justifications for exercise of power. Uh, and that is uh, what some of my work uh, has focused on to date around a culture of justification uh, that seeks to uh, further both political and rule of law modes of accountability um, within what I'm describing as here, a network of rules, principles, and practices. So the separation of powers doesn't really communicate any of this. It doesn't really say anything about justification and it is inherently uh, suspicious of any forms of overlap or informal arrangements. Um, uh, and so that's partly why I've turned back to the idea of the mixed constitution, um, which uh, facilitates both written and unwritten arrangements and powers uh, and also uh, allows us to talk about parts of the constitution that are not always visible as the Supreme Court hinted at uh, in the quote that I have, I have employed. So to take three examples, uh, conventions themselves uh, uh, fit easily with the idea of a mixed constitution and its fluidity um, uh, and use of often informal rather than formal power in order to secure uh, uh, an appropriate outcome. Um, but it really, they do sit awkwardly with a very formal understanding of the separations of power, uh, the separation of powers principle. Um, the second, and that was the focus of my earlier piece uh, for the Center for Constitutional Studies uh, that was responding to Professor Levy's paper, and I do recommend the papers that all responded to that uh, keynote address that was a great issue, um, is the administrative state, of course. 
um, since administrative bodies are governments in miniature, and so they combine and merge uh, all, sometimes all three uh, branches' powers, and that seems to violate a bright line formal separation of powers. And they also simultaneously exercise a variety of formal and informal powers, especially when it comes to discretionary power, which is not rule-based power, but takes a variety of forms. And so that also seems to violate some bright line conceptions of the separation of powers, but wouldn't pose a, uh, a problem for the idea of mixed government. Um, uh, a third example is talked about by Dennis Baker in his uh, 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 paper uh, on constitutional dialogue in an edited collection around constitutional dialogue, uh, where he talks about coordinate construction of the Constitution. And I mention that because um, uh, I'll return to that at the end. But the idea that no one branch uh, has sole control over interpreting the Constitution, it's a form of interpretive pluralism, uh, uh, is in his uh, mind an example of uh, uh, a modern understanding of the separation of powers uh, as well as uh, an example of constitutional dialogue. Um, and of course, those of us in administrative law have long known that uh, uh, there are shared interpretive functions between courts and administrative actors. Uh, and that attests to uh, the diversity aspect uh, that is part of this panel. Um, not only uh, the larger world of uh, legal pluralism, uh, but a kind of multi-juralism if we include uh, the administrative state as part of a multi-jural uh, legal order. So the mixed constitution allows us to see a different kind of separation of powers in public governments while also uh, embracing the primary purpose of you know, guaranteeing separate, separate bases of public power. Um, it permits a more sophisticated understanding of the whole complex of public power, and it facilitates uh, a conception of interinstitutional constitutional responsibility. That's what I call dialogue, and others do too. And um, that's comprised of a more uh, complex and complete set of practices operating with dynamics of informal and formal power, cooperation, and countervailing principles. Um, and so when things don't work, uh, one hopes that more than the separation of powers, this uh, ethos of a mixed constitution can help us be creative in devising remedies uh, in order to uh, permit where, where checks are not working, where there are problematic overlaps or uh, enabling better cooperation and responsiveness. Uh, the second recasting uh, is around, as I said, the liberal mixed constitution in Canadian society. Um, and so this is uh, where the where uh, it's a bit drafty this part of the paper, uh, and and so I hope that this will tie in with the other uh, panel papers, uh, and we can have a discussion about this. So I'm picking up with the Burkean style of constitutionalism that the Supreme Court evokes in that quote from the Patriation Reference, and I want to suggest that it provides um, space for a different kind of imaginary about constitutionalism that isn't completely tied to liberalism or social contract theory, which especially have been dominant frames for understanding the Constitution Act of 1982 and the entrenched Bill of Rights. Um, and so it's this idea of returning to the idea of the Constitution as composed of many actors and bodies, those constituent parts of the states that are not just formally the three branches, who hold public faith uh, and who can legitimately expect the state to keep faith with them uh, through constitutional commitments. And so the first point I want to make here is that the mixed constitution offers a way to read the constitution along with and outside of a dominant liberal paradigm. The second point is this communal perspective on the constitution. Um, and again, this is another way to rethink the separation of powers. Um, and uh, I'm not the only uh, person doing this, so I'm relying a lot on a, on a larger literature, now global, uh, on um, separation of powers, uh, mixed constitution, uh, and modern governance. Uh, and so here, um, the danger is that we um, only rely, especially under the separation of powers, on the state to do the kind of dialoguing in a constitutional order. Um, uh, but we also have to uh, include civil society and actors from civil society. Uh, and so in the older notion of the mixed constitution, that was, of course, uh, those three um, um, bodies of society, the, the sort of uh, monarchical, aristocratic and democratic. But we, you know, we cannot return to that way of thinking about uh, the, the civil society. 
uh, and social aspects of the constitutional order. Um, and so one way is thinking about it in a more communitarian way. Obviously, I'm returning to a, an older conversation between liberalism and communitarianism, and which has always informed our understanding of federalism. Uh, around uh, the, the federalism is not just about a division of powers, another kind of separation of power between levels of government, but there's a representative function um, about um, how certain political communities within Canada ought to be treated. Uh, and so obviously uh, this um, um, socio-political uh, community, which may have a constitutive uh, role and base in our constitution, um, um, can be incorporated under the mixed constitution, but not the separation of powers. And that has implications for Quebec and for indigenous peoples. Stretched further, uh, which is what I want to do and where I'm going with it, is that we could see how institutions that are traditionally not uh, viewed as constitutional actors uh, 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 are. Uh, and so we have uh, new literatures trying to understand bodies like Elections Canada or the Bank of Canada as parts of the constitutional order, although we would never have thought of that, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. We might also think about other kinds of political actors who are not formally part of government, but actually play a constitutive role um, or have constituent interest to be part of this broader, more organic constitution. Um, that might be the media, for example, or it could be religious or linguistic communities. Um, but my point here is that these, um, this idea of, uh, of uh, the societal dimension of the constitution that the mixed const uh, constitutional principle evokes um, uh, would be helpful in understanding uh, a more contextual constitutional landscape. So I know I'm at the end. Uh, so uh, what I will say uh, is just two points. Um, uh, I, I want to revive uh, the mixed constitution and in the way that it is uh, related to, but distinct from the separation of powers. Um, my goal is not to really compl complexify the separation of powers, because uh, I don't actually think that's going to be a promising avenue, and I'm not alone on this, uh, that I'm not aiming to bring back the idea of a mixed constitution as a live constitutional principle. I think that would involve too much interpretive work. Um, but I do think that it is possible to uh, read some of the um, uh, descriptive and prescriptive potential that the mixed constitution provides for us uh, in the idea of constitutional and institutional dialogue. And, and where I end on this point in the paper is where others like uh, Owen Carolyn in his book, The New Separation of Powers, and Eileen Kavanaugh in her work on the separation of powers also end up. Uh, is, is that we, uh, we all settle on, we've got to revive the idea of institutional and constitutional dialogue, which has unfortunately lain dormant in Canada for 20 years now, uh, and uh, that it might be a more fruitful way of talking about uh, various forms of pluralism and accountability in our constitutional order. Um, and so I'll leave some other points for a discussion and question and answer. Professor Liston, uh, uh, we now turn to Professor Shepard. Okay, merci. C'est un grand plaisir uh, de participer dans ce colloque aujourd'hui. Un grand merci aux organisateurs et organisatrices. Je vais faire ma présentation en anglais, mais les questions ou commentaires en français sont les bienvenus. I'm speaking to you today from Montreal and McGill University sites of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. I wish to acknowledge these nations as the traditional stewards of the territory from which I speak. I think it's particularly important on this 40th anniversary to recognize both the historical and continuing harms experienced by Indigenous peoples in our country and to redress their exclusion from the, patriarch uh, from the patriarch patriation project. So to begin, I just wanted to share a few reflections on the significance of this anniversary to my own personal <clears throat> trajectory, to situate myself within our history. I think anniversaries prompt us to reflect on, um, on how we fit into these larger historical moments. <clears throat> I was born and raised in Toronto, but have lived most of my life in Montreal, drawn to French and to Quebec. Bilingualism has given me a way not only of, has given me not only new ways of communicating, uh, but also new ways of thinking. And at the time, but at the time of patriation, I was just beginning my legal studies. 
I was in Toronto and the charter therefore, which was my focus at the time, has been a constant companion throughout my career. Even prior to studying law, however, I was also active in the women's movement. And at the time, um, there was the historic women's conference in Ottawa in February 1981. And we were focused almost exclusively on mobilizing to constitutionalize women's rights. I wasn't really thinking about any amending formula or about the fact that our constitution was a British statute or I was, we were focused on the rights dimensions of this constitutional moment. So when this conference was announced, it prompted me to reflect uh, about really my career and the charter and patriation and about an ongoing concern I've had over the years about this divide between political power and sovereignty on the one hand, those dimensions of patriation and the rights dimensions on the other. So in my presentation today, which is uh, sort of called Patriation Paradigm, Sovereignty, Power and Rights, I put together the abstract before I was quite sure of my argument, but I've worked it out over the last few months. I try to connect these two sides of patriation, the power sovereignty dimensions and the rights dimensions. And most specifically, I want to argue that the concepts of sovereign authority and power, which I wasn't thinking about, back in, in 1981 and 1982. I want to argue that those are critically relevant to the groups and communities who so many years ago mobilized for constitutional rights. And think about how we might reconceptualize rights, both indigenous rights and charter rights, to redress and to address power inequities and governance issues. So I want to do three things today. One, I want to just set out the standard sort of patriation paradigm or story. Then I want to identify a few important challenges to this dominant paradigm. And then I want to outline the contours of an alternative paradigm for patriation. So arguably, it is only when sovereignty and rights are reshaped towards a new paradigm of patriation that we will actually be able to celebrate fully the coming home of our constitution. So if we turn first to the sort of standard or the dominant narrative around patriation, I think, as I mentioned, it, it was considered to be critically important in two domains, full Canadian sovereignty and constitutionally protected rights. Patriation was seen as sort of breaking a, another strand in Canada's colonial relationship with Britain. It constitutionally entrenched a range of rights and freedoms, including indigenous rights. Uh, but these two sides were viewed differently by diverse communities and political actors. The affirmation of Canadian sovereignty was seen and was discussed and was most critical to those who were already exercising political power in Canada, specifically to federal and provincial political actors. The negotiations leading up to patriation engaged an exclusive group of white male provincial and federal politicians and the protection of the focus was on protecting jurisdiction, political power, the amending formula, last minute compromises such as the notwithstanding clause were a federal concession to provincial premiers concerned about the risks of losing their powers. In contrast, rights were understood as a promise to the politically dispossessed. They were to secure equality, freedom, security of the person to name but a few. Social movements, including those engaging women, persons with disabilities, linguistic minorities, multicultural and racialized communities had mobilized extensively for express inclusion in the new rights to be affirmed in the constitution. So too did indigenous peoples, although their mobilization from the very beginning, I think, contested the sovereignty claims of the Canadian states in ways that some of the other groups mobilizing for rights did not. And the drafting of the charter also included rights and safeguards in response to this uh, mobilization, certainly. Um, and that specifically, um, the textual provisions in the charter were designed to ensure that the judiciary would give, a const would give constitutional rights and freedoms an expansive and generous interpretation, that we would shift away from the more narrow and formalistic interpretations of rights, characteristic of the Canadian Bill of Rights jurisprudence. So this, I think, is one version of the story of Canadian constitutionalism. 
I want to suggest, however, that there's another version that lies beneath the surface of this standard story. Uh, and the, these two central dimensions of the traditional paradigm, that is full, complete Canadian sovereignty and the entrenchment of constitutional rights, I think have been the focus of some compelling and critical challenges. So in terms of sovereignty, I think uh, the traditional concept, and I must say this paper has prompted me to think about certain concepts which I don't usually focus on. My whole focus has pretty much been on equality rights, so I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone here. But in relation to sovereignty, which is uh, the traditionally has been premised on this Westphalian or nation state based territorial sovereignty conception. I think that traditional concept of sovereignty has been challenged both externally by external and internal forces. So in terms of external challenges, uh, Nancy Fraser's book on book on scales of justice. Uh, in that book, she points to a whole range of factors, geopolitical instabilities, superpower unilateralism, globalization, the rise of transnational entities, and then concludes that in reality, the social processes that shape our lives routinely overflow territorial borders. So we're celebrating this full Canadian sovereignty at a moment when over the past 40 years, traditional territorial nation state sovereignty has been challenged from external forces. So from a global perspective in a world that is fundamentally interconnected, traditional conceptions of nation state territorial sovereignty seem inaccurate and incomplete. And in fact, this emergence of global constitutionalism, I think, is a response to this phenomenon. Now, traditional understandings of sovereignty have also been challenged internally. Um, in the Canadian context, um, I think I want to highlight three such internal challenges to sovereignty. First, there's been this long-standing notion that political power is shared by two orders of government, federal and provincial and increasingly territorial, a reality that fundamentally challenges any notion, singular notion of sovereignty. Uh, federalism has been conceptualized and affir to affirm provincial autonomy within territorial spheres of jurisdiction. And so I think we can, in the Canadian context and in a federalism system where we have to complement, complicate a unitary notion of sovereignty to make room for provincial and territorial and other forms of sovereignty. In the pre, but in the pre-patriation context where growing Quebec nationalism seemed to threaten the unity of the Canadian state. Um, as Guy Laforet explains, the Trudeau quote, the Trudeau vision of the constitution embraced Canadian sovereignty as a means to challenge Quebec nationalism. And that this action, he suggests, led to the end of the Canadian dream that was created through the Confederation, a dream that was premised on a kind of shared sovereignty. The exclusion of Quebec reflects from the final accord at the time of patriation, reflects this shift and has continued to undermine Canadian unity. So that's one challenge to the traditional view of Canadian sovereignty. A second, um, secondly, the colonial assertion, assertion of Canadian sovereignty has long been challenged by Indigenous peoples. And patriation did not redress the erasure of indigenous sovereignty in the colonial practices and assumptions of Canadian constitutionalism. The underlying legal justifications for the assertion of Canadian sovereignty have been, uh, numerous scholars have revealed how they are flawed and deeply problematic. Um, nor was indigenous sovereignty clearly affirmed in the framing of Aboriginal rights. Uh, the patriation moment appeared as a time when Indigenous sovereignty could potentially have been, and it might have been a time when it had, could have been recognized, and the Indigenous, indigenous peoples mobilized to that effect. The colonial legal fiction could have been remedied, but as numerous scholars and activists have lamented, it was not to be the case, and it's an ongoing challenge. A third, uh, the unitary, a unitary conception of sovereignty has also been challenged beyond uh, by those who have been historically excluded from the formal channels of political power. And this is a more radical reconceptualization of sovereignty that goes beyond potentially formal orders of government 
perhaps bringing in some of the ideas that Mary was talking about in terms of pluralism, but sovereignty, particularly some feminist conceptions of sovereignty, view it as a bottom-up concept rooted in a more radical conception of democratic politics. In terms of rights, um, they were no doubt fundamentally important and they are a critical source of legal and normative guidance. And I have worked most of my career trying to ensure an expansive uh, understanding, interpretation and protection for fundamental human rights. But the traditional approach to rights based on protection of substantive entitlements that are defined and enforced by governmental and judicial actors has been subject to very powerful critiques. Now, one of those critiques has been put forward in the work of uh, Wendy Brown, for example, where she, her article on the paradoxes of rights, she argues that ironically rights reduce subordination, but often fail to challenge either the regime or the mechanisms of reproduction that cause the inequalities and violations. So rights recognize substantive harms but not the political, institutional, or structural conditions that produce and perpetuate those harms. So they're substantive, but not, they don't attend to the structural or the systemic. Now, in the context of the patriation debates, uh, charter rights were framed predominantly as negative civil and political rights within a classical liberal tradition to be claimed by individuals and defined by judges. There were exceptions. There was Section 15.2, the Affirmative Action Provision. There were the framing of positive and collective rights in um, terms of linguistic minority rights. Um, and there were the Indigenous rights. But the Charter generally, rights were layered onto an institutional and structural status quo. So the channeling of rights claims through the courts also creates access to justice impediments and reinforces the power of a traditionally conservative and fairly an elite institution, the judiciary, to define the content of rights and remedies. Now, though potentially transformative in some cases, the courts often tend to provide remedies that don't challenge these underlying structural or systemic dimensions. A further critique of rights is their tendency to reinforce both victimization narratives and essentialist understandings of group-based identities. Uh, so I'm, I won't go into that now for the purposes of time. So how those critiques are quite powerful. How then, in the face of these compelling challenges, might we reimagine both sovereignty and rights? Now, with respect to sovereignty, rather than celebrating patriation as a marker of full Canadian sovereignty, I think it would be more apt to recognize how sovereignty in the global era has fundamentally changed. Um, and to think about what the significance of that is for our understanding of sovereignty. But in my presentation, I want to focus on how the internal challenges to the conceptions of sovereignty should prompt a rethinking of the patriation project. Most significantly, rather than viewing the reality of shared, or some might say divided sovereignties within Canada as a source of divisiveness, I think it's precisely the recognition of multiple sovereignties that will allow for unity across our differences. So with respect to Quebec, I think our understanding of sovereignty must include a robust endorsement of the sovereignty and autonomy of provinces and territories, most specifically Quebec. Greater recognition of such sovereignty will reinforce our unity, as I just mentioned. Concepts such as asymmetrical federalism or equitable federalism, attentive to divergent provincial and territorial realities, I think is the only way to solidify the unity of our confederation. With respect to Indigenous sovereignty, it's a critically important dimension of an alternative patriation paradigm. It's if we are to imagine a future where real uh, reconciliation is actually realized, I think that the inherent sovereignty of Indigenous peoples has to be a critical part of that. Uh, now, one alternative approach I th which recognizes a rethinking of sovereignty was put forward, and I'll just present one idea how, uh, in the final report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples where they emphasized that shared sovereignty is a hallmark of, Canadian Feder of the Canadian Federation and a central feature of a three-cornered relation between Aboriginal, provincial, and federal governments. These governments 
<clears throat> are sovereign within their respective spheres and hold their powers by virtue of their constitutional status rather than by delegation. So there we see already back in the 90s a reconfigured vision of sovereignty. Beyond, <clears throat> no, beyond um, uh, recognition of the ways in which sovereignty characterizes federal as well as provincial territorial increasingly and indigenous orders of government. As I mentioned earlier, emerging, emerging feminist scholarship on sovereignty takes us even a step further. It extends sovereignty beyond formal governance structures to civil society and to community level political and democratic engagement. One interesting example of this extension emerges in the work of Hester Lassard on jurisdictional justice, where she recasts traditional debates about federalism beyond formal levels of government to look at the importance of civil society, social movements and political mobilization in grassroots local struggles. And in that context, she looked at the insight uh, case in particular. So feminist rethinking of conceptions of sovereignty extended beyond the state to governance operating within communities. Now, in terms of rights, and this is the last part of my presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, a rethinking of rights, I think, must focus on their transformative potential. So to what extent might our understanding of constitutional rights go beyond substantive claims for protection? within the current institutional and societal power structures towards a vision where enhanced democratic participation, social inclusion, political agency to contest a, a narrative of victimization and institutional change become incorporated into our rights frameworks. Interestingly, our reformulation of rights in this way takes us onto the domain of the political, onto the terrain of sovereignty understood broadly areas which I think were overlooked by equality seeking groups or sometimes are. Of course, indigenous peoples always understood the critical link between sovereignty and rights, insisting that section 35 um, be interpreted to recognize and affirm indigenous legal orders, laws and jurisdiction. For charter rights claims have not always incorporated concerns about how power structures and systems are central to understanding how rights violations occur. In the domain of minority language rights, there has been some movement in this direction. For example, the Supreme Court of Canada in the Arsenault Cameron case wrote that empowerment is essential to correct past injustices and to guarantee the specific needs of the minority language community. Um, if we turn to equality, which is the area I've done most, the most work in, um, at the time of patriation, as I mentioned, we were mobilizing to include rights and include, inc secure an expansive interpretation of them by the judiciary. But much of the mobilization still, assumed the, still presumed the retroactive, um, that retroactive right claims would be made by individuals and channeled through the apparatus of the courts. Um, over three decades later, as equality rights continue to be a contested terrain and at a time when provincial governments are using their sovereign authority to opt out of the charter um, and out of their provincial human rights obligations at the same time, the significance of Section 28 is being put to the test. Uh, and I know figuring out how all these sovereignties relate to each other is something I haven't yet worked out. But nevertheless, with respect to equality, um, courts have steadfastly endeavored to elaborate a substantive conception of, of constitutional equality with its lodestar of equitable outcomes. But even beyond the importance of affirming a robust substantive definition, I think we need an approach to equality that is attentive to the systemic and structural dimensions of its reproduction. And this would open up the potential for more transformative constitutional equality rights to remedy discrimination that is embedded in systems and structures requires new ways of thinking about rights that attends to um, the systemic and structural dimensions, as I mentioned, and that moves towards more innovative and forward-looking remedies. Um, such transformative remedies, and I'm thinking also interesting um, in Naomi Metallic's speech about uh, structural injunctions and 
courageous remedies, one must could think about how they could redress institutional and societal exclusion from decision-making processes and democratic governance. In my own work, I've called this approach inclusive equality because it builds an approach to equality that requires political and social inclusion, specifically of those who have been historically and structurally excluded from political power, sovereignty, institutional decision-making and structures of democratic participation. So to conclude uh, in reflecting on patriation, uh, the patriation anniversary, I've come to realize there really can be no clear dichotomy between sovereignty and rights, despite the fact that I lived the moment historically in that way. That sovereignty instead should be conceptualized in a context where power is shared, relational, and multiple. And that it also should extend and be relevant to communities within civil society. And that this reconceptualized understanding of sovereignty is also central to the realization of rights, uh, such that they not only guarantee important substantive guarantees, but also secure the inclusion of historically excluded groups and communities from the systems and structures of political power and institutional decision making. Merci uh, de votre attention. Professor Shepard. Uh, so finally, we will go to Professor Newman. Are you there, Professor Newman? Okay, well, maybe what I'll do at this juncture is, um, okay, I think uh, Professor Newman is going to uh, be joining us here in a moment. Uh, in the meantime, I would invite you again, if you have uh, questions that you'd like to ask of the panelists, uh, to feel free to put those questions in the chat now uh, so that we have time for a few questions at the end and, and we can get ourselves organized. Um, I will say while I'm waiting, while we're waiting here, um, some some things that uh, come to my mind about the presentations. Oh, I see Professor Newman's ready. Feel free to uh, appear now, Professor Newman. But um, I, I'll hold my comments then till the Q and A period. Um, are you there? I'm here. Sorry, I, I didn't know if you're doing comments on the others. Go ahead, or however you want to proceed. I was just killing time, so uh, why don't you uh, go ahead, and uh, we will all have an opportunity to discuss at the end. Okay. Sorry about that uh, confusion. There just uh, arose something here, but. Um, uh, in 27, uh, so first of all, thank you for having me here, and um, uh, it's a very important conference, and I'm very pleased to be able to be part of this panel uh, and alongside such important papers as we've just heard. In 2017, Anthea Roberts published an important book, Is International Law International?, in which she asked whether there was actually a unified approach to international law across jurisdictions or whether approaches to international law differed significantly within different cultural and educational systems and thus jurisdictions. She went further than asking that question but amassed significant evidence on uh, the education of international law academics in different countries, international law textbooks in different national contexts, and ultimately different and competing national traditions of international law. While I won't here amass the same quantity of material in response to the question, I raise here a question inspired by hers, asking, is Canadian constitutional law Canadian? To be clear, I ask that question not in the sense of whether Canadian constitutional law is distinctive relative to the traditions of other states, such as the United Kingdom or United States, but rather whether Canadian constitutional law is unified at a pan-Canadian level. Is there one patriated body of constitutional law across Canada 
or are there sufficient indications as to raise questions about such a claim that would warrant further and more detailed investigation? I'm going to claim that there are significant disunities in the body of Canadian constitutional law. I will highlight troubling cleavages on linguistic lines, lines related to association with divergent models of constitutional sources, and lines associated with approaches to constitutional interpretation. Overall, I will argue that there must be significant questions on whether there is indeed Canadian constitutional law that is pan-Canadian that warrant a lot more attention. Consider first some of the linguistic cleavages present within the context of English-French bilingualism. These cleavages have more effects than often realized on constitutional text itself, on case law, and perhaps most significantly on constitutional scholarship and its ongoing contributions to constitutional debates. Turning first to the matter of constitutional text. Obviously, the Constitution Act 1982 was adopted in an officially bilingual form. There are linguistic discrepancies between the two official versions that have given rise to case law on how to reconcile those, such as with the differing versions of some words in the Section 24 Remedies Clause in the Charter. Or where case law has not yet arisen, there has sometimes been scholarship noting some of the potential future discrepancies to be subjects of analysis, such as in differences in the Section 1 Limitations Clause of the Charter. But in one sense, with those, everyone is wrestling in principle with the same bilingual text, even if at a practical level, only one language version receives attention in many cases in parts of the country not inclined uh, to engage in the first instance in extensive bilingual discussion. But the 1982 patriation, in addition to leaving Quebec out of the final constitutional deal, also failed to resolve the long-standing problem of the bulk of Canada's constitutional texts being in English only. Long-standing commitments to translate at least the Constitution Act 1867, notably through the constitutional commitment of an expeditious translation in Section 55 of the Constitution Act 1982 itself, which is the subject of a, a whole additional panel later today at this conference. Well, those, those commitments have come to naught, at least in official terms. Um, while there was an attempt at a translation, and Justice Canada prints an unofficial translation of the Constitution Act 1867 alongside the English version, distinguishing them in subtle ways, um, the, that's not the sole French language version of the Constitution 1867 in circulation. The government of Quebec has le recently produced what it calls an administrative codification of the Constitution Acts. In relation to the Constitution Act 1867, the French language translations set out in that work are related article by article to versions proposed within texts by various constitutional scholars or where available, translations within Supreme Court of Canada judgments then attributed to, to those justices whose judgments had been translated. The result is the consolidated text set out within that work differs from the French language version distributed by Justice Canada. And uh, examining those, I think that those are sometimes differences in ways that could be legally significant if one considered the two different texts. So there are actually differing constitutional texts in use, um, such there are actual cleavages on, on the constitutional text itself. I will return later to a further underlying dimension of the linguistically based cleavages, particularly in the context of constitutional scholarship. Um, for the moment, though, it's worth noting that a different set of cleavages arise in relation to what sources count as constitutional sources in Canadian law, with some of these cleavages being more technical and some being more interpretive. To turn to a technical um, one, but one of significance, Section 52.2 contains an enumeration of the contents of the Constitution of Canada, albeit with wording suggesting its enumeration may be non-exhaustive because it says that the Constitution of Canada includes a number of texts listed in the schedule of the Constitution Act 1982. Well, some would certainly take the view that the Royal Proclamation of 1763 is some sort of instrument of Canadian constitutional law, and there's case law referring to it as a sort of Magna Carta for Indigenous peoples. 
um, and there are robust readings of section 25 of the charter that see it as if it grants some type of constitutional significance to the Royal Proclamation of 1763. However, the enumeration within the, the schedule referenced by 52.2 doesn't contain the Royal Proclamation on the list. And uh, so some take the view that it's not a constitutional instrument. Cleavages arise on what documents are and are not part of the Constitution of Canada, and thus constitutional sources in the more technical sense of constitutional text. Going beyond the text, though, the Supreme Court of Canada demonstrated as recently as this past fall a tremendously deep division on the matter of the constitutional status of so-called unwritten principles of constitutional law. In the City of Toronto case, the court split almost evenly, five to four, on whether unwritten constitutional principles could serve as an independent basis for striking down the legislation in question exemplifying a fundamental division on the nature of particular sources of constitutional law. Larger questions concern matters uh, like in what way Indigenous legal norms are or are not recognized by the Constitution as sources of law in specific contexts, as well as ways in which Indigenous legal norms are or are not themselves constitutional in some form within the Constitution of Canada. On these matters, the range of different analyses shouldn't be underestimated by those who see some particular answer as itself clear, obvious, and even morally necessary. Even while many academics routinely write of Indigenous rights of self-government as if they were constitutionally recognized, and the federal government operated on this basis um, in its 1995 uh, basis for, uh, for negotiating comprehensive claims, the governing case law from the Supreme Court of Canada on self-government from the Pomajuan case has over nearly three decades been much more constraining to the point of suggesting only limited spheres of constitutionally recognized self-governing powers in the view of the Supreme Court of Canada. Interactions, uh, so there's one example. To, to take another, interactions of Indigenous rights and parliamentary powers have seen the statement of positions as if they were obvious uh, by some that have subsequently been rejected by the Supreme Court of Canada um, in the, uh, the Mikasu Cree 2018 case um, and ongoing divisions on, on just what counts as a... Uh, an appropriate interaction in that context uh, that ultimately relates to questions about sources of constitutional law, I think. The question of in what ways Indigenous legal norms are or are not part of Canadian law has arisen in many uh, recent cases. A, a, an astonishing number uh, that are starting to rule upon this uh, has many complex facets, even before we would get to the matter of if in some contexts Indigenous legal norms infuse Canadian constitutional law itself. Those matters need a fuller discussion of their own, uh, and I'm uh, unfortunately only touching upon something uh, that's that's very serious and needs that discussion, uh, but I'll hope to turn to that in, in other work in the, the near future. A further set of cleavages arise in the context of constitutional interpretation. For a certain period, there were seemingly official versions of constitutional interpretation that Canada employed purposive and so-called living tree analysis, and many scholars uh, continue to assert uh, that as the appropriate approach to constitutional interpretation in Canada. However, even at a descriptive level, that claim has become subject to more questioning in recent years. And here I would refer to the important work of Ben Oliphant and Leonid Sirota uh, that's shown the presence of much originalist reasoning in Canadian constitutional jurisprudence, albeit quite inconsistently um, from case to case. Beyond that, um, the invocation of the so-called living tree principle through much of the charter jurisprudence has come under different kinds of questioning as well, going beyond descriptive challenges, including an important work by Professor Bradley Miller, as he then was, uh, that raises the question of whether that, uh, that invocation had properly invoked the, uh, the precedent from the person's case um, uh, or had distorted the reasoning of the person's case in how it had been invoked to support living tree analysis. 
saying these sorts of things might make the point only that there's messiness present more so than that there are actual cleavages on constitutional interpretation. But there are actual real differences in what's stated on constitutional interpretation by those who continue to adhere to so-called living tree analysis and those increasingly putting forward originalist and textualist methodologies of constitutional interpretation. And I'd suggest that those methodologies are far more widespread than many may have realized to this point. I would cite here the important paper of Justice Colin Feesby that's being presented uh, tomorrow within this same conference um, that identifies a very strong move towards originalist and textualist methodologies in constitutional interpretation. But there are real cleavages there um, because uh, there's a disagreement over the very method of interpretation um, and there would be a disagreement um, between those adhering strongly to one version or another on whether the arguments of the other side even count as constitutional interpretation. Um, that, that arises in constitutional interpretation generally. We could also raise specific issues. To consider one specific context, I would point to radically different views on what one might call the classical tradition of Canadian federalism as experienced in various clashes over federal assertions of power in recent years. Here, the divisions again reach deeper than disagreements about the law within shared premises on how to approach the law, but they relate to matters like whether certain arguments count. Do arguments about the consequences of particular division of powers determinations count as arguments on the constitutional issue at stake? There would be different views on that. Do arguments derived from the constitutional text about particular powers count as arguments or not? And again, there would be people who argue both sides of that, um, as we see in some of the recent cases. These aren't just disagreements on weight, but real cleavages about what even counts as an appropriate form of constitutional argumentation and constitutional interpretation. In a short comment on this topic, I can't purport to explain fully these linguistic, source-related, and interpretation-related cleavages or their origins. But thinking about their origins, it's not difficult to suggest that there could be various self-reinforcing phenomena at play. One can amass evidence in various ways that Anglophone constitutional scholars have largely not cited Francophone constitutional scholarship. Uh, not to say they never have, but uh, there's a significant undercitation of Francophone constitutional scholarship in Anglophone constitutional scholarship. And then that's something that would tend to be perpetuated over time um, by those who read uh, the scholarship that doesn't cite the other scholarship. One can point to evidence of different canons of central constitutional cases divided across parts of the country, as between, for example, Quebec and outside Quebec, um, uh, and as between parts of the country where indigenous issues play a more central role and those where they receive less attention. And the pedagogy of those canons of what are the leading constitutional cases will get perpetuated because they're the cases that are taught um, and they get perpetuated then within later work of other scholars and practitioners, um, but in divided ways in different parts of the country that see uh, the constitutional canon in meaningfully different ways to at least uh, uh, a degree. One can point to signs of areas of constitutional law that are actually developing quite differently as between different provinces. And uh, in the, the, the paper, I'll cite some examples as between uh, Quebec case law that's developed in ways that, that haven't been really noticed outside Quebec, uh, these, these sorts of matters. One can speak anecdotally of constitutional pedagogy being substantially different in different law schools. Uh, just to give one example at a very anecdotal level, I can say that the amount of time spent in a first year constitutional law course on division of powers, as distinct from uh, charter issues, which tend to dominate it, ranges from a full semester at some law schools 
to two months at some law schools, to two weeks at others, or in one instance of which I heard recently, uh, two hours. Um, so one can speak of constitutional law courses at schools that, uh, that teach very differently about the contents of Canadian constitutional law. Um, we could go on to, to other examples of that, but I, uh, I should wrap up briefly. Um, I'll just say that again, that kind of pedagogy perpetuates itself in some ways. So it, it reflects a cleavage that exists, but it perpetuates a cleavage for the future um, if, there's, uh, if there's any systematic dimension uh, to how that divides, and I think there is. Part of the Canadian constitutional legacy, even four decades after patriation, includes some fracturing across the very face of Canadian constitutionalism. I don't want to end on an entirely pessimistic note, um, although uh, uh, I think there are some real challenges ahead, but there are ways forward as well, and they have to involve uh, more reading across our differences and more intense scholarship and simply more investment in serious study of Canadian constitutional law as Canadian uh, uh, and as, uh, as something uh, that brings together people across differences within the country. Uh, we need to be dialoguing about curricula and pedagogy and substance, and there, there are no easy ways forward, but there's much more work ahead. Uh, patriation was uh, one way station, uh, but there are many miles ahead in the post-patriation uh, legacies uh, that aren't just something that we take on board, but something that will continue to define in the decades ahead. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Professor Newman. I'd like to invite uh, all of the speakers to turn on their cameras now for the Q&A period. Um, so far, we don't have any questions in the chat. I would again invite folks if they'd like to uh, pose questions to our, our speakers. In the meantime, I do have uh, questions for each of the speakers. Um, and I'll start with uh, Professor Liston. Uh, uh, really three very interesting uh, papers, I think, raising some, you know, genuinely new avenues for uh, discussion and debate, which is always, uh, always exciting. Um, Mary, I don't know if I'll be able to get this question off right. So, you know, apologies if I, I don't. But um, I guess my question for you is in thinking about this kind of contemporary um, rendering of the mixed constitution that I think you're ultimately advocating for, um, I guess I'm wondering, you know, what role you think patriation itself sort of plays in um in this contemporary rendering so do you think in essence that you know we should um adopt this sort of new understanding of the mixed constitution because that's really the constitution we have now you know it, um as a result of the kind of combined effect of the old and new constitution so is there something about 82 that's significant um, do you think that this is just an account that reflects the contemporary reality of, of Canadian uh, public institutions? I've been reading some work by Professor Berger, where uh, Kate Glover Berger, where she talks about, you know, we need an account of the constitutional role of the administrative state that just reflects the admin state we have now. Um, or do you think, and these are, maybe you have some other explanation, or do you think that, you know, what you're advocating for is a sort of corrective account, right? Like a, um, a version of the mixed constitution that um, takes an idea and makes it kind of relevant and applicable in, in you know, Canadian, modern Canadian constitutional law. Um, no, I, I, these are questions that I myself struggle over in trying to think <laughs> about the relationship between the old and the new constitution. Um, so I'm very curious kind of how you end up with those, um, with this account that I find very appealing. Um, there we go. I'll do my best, Vanessa. <laughs> um, uh, but some of this touches on some things I'm still thinking through. I, I guess uh, 
I guess my first response is uh, not so much about 1982, but about 1867, that we still really need to understand what was going on in 1867. Um, and it's really only dawning on me that there's so much we need to rethink about 1867 in Canada, including um, what is implicit in the constitutional backdrop, which may be an interpretive backdrop, which we always filter through the preamble. And, you know, partly that was a realization around a number of reading that I did two summers ago on, um, you know, the history of, of law in Canada, that like massive three volume project <laughs> where I was interested in, in particular what was happening in BC and and honestly, in relation to Indigenous peoples, we really have to understand history differently. Uh, and I think that's partly Colleen's point as well. And I think Dwight is touching on that. So I actually think we have to go back to 1867, have a real hard look at that. Uh, and then we come to 1982 and patriation. And I guess that's where, uh, you know, you use the word corrective and the other one relevant. So, yeah, I, I think, um, I don't think, I, so as I said, I don't really, I'm not advocating to bring back the concept and, you know, hey, we have a new principle, the mixed constitution. But if it's there, then we can make use of it. And my larger point was we had this metaphor of, uh, you know, first institutional and then constitutional dialogue, which is dropped off the face of Canadian jurisprudence. It's been picked up globally. So all sorts of stuff is happening globally about dialogue. And it seems to me that's a fruitful place to begin rethinking some of this. And now one of the plot, which, as you point out, has coming out of my own work in administrative law and other administrative law scholars, which is, you know, dialogue has been happening in administrative law like forever, uh, including remedies and interpretation. So maybe we should think about subconstitutional law like administrative law for insights about constitutional law. And the second is to get at the different dimensions. So there are other theories of dialogue, which are about democratic dialogue, participatory dialogue, uh, federalism as dialogue. Um, and you know, then there's a useful vehicle to see overlapping understandings of this concept of dialogue. And dialogue doesn't have to be empty and thin. And so there's a great paper by Emmett McFarlane uh, who, who says we need to we need to dialogue about dialogue about what it means and that there are multiple forms that can be empirically shown and we don't do enough of that in Canada as well as um, an interesting normative lens whether it's prescriptive or identifying the problems that there may be dialogic remedies maybe they're maybe they're hard edged dialogic remedies like um, supervisory jurisdiction in language rights cases or you know, structural injunctions, are, right? They, they would just point our eye to, well, what do we want the constitution to do? Which is a reflection of where we are, which is we can't have it do everything. Uh, some things are impossible as our first panel talked about amendments. So we have to go to other formal and informal modes of constitutional change, devolution, which uh, Naomi Metallic talked about, about understanding legislation differently. Like when we devolve powers, to uh, from the state to indigenous communities that's constitutional and so much can happen at that level so it really is a call to start thinking about these things not through like legislation as ordinary legislation not through administrative laws ordinary <laughs> administrative law as i said there are other actors and entities constituent parts um come in many forms and that's really i think a uh, kind of hopeful, <laughs> at least scholarly trajectory, whether, you know, hopefully there'll be political payoff. I hope that made sense. Did. Yeah. And, you know, I'm happy to hear you say you're still thinking through this because I think, you know, my impression of so many of the ideas that were discussed today is that these are, you know, this is the beginning of, of new conversations about, you know, where uh, the Canadian constitution is headed. Okay. There's a question here in the chat. Um, for Professor Newman, uh, and here it is. If I, uh, okay, uh, challenges aside, is the existence of the cleavages that you discuss potentially a good thing, in the sense that democratic constitutions are meant to speak uh, uh, to people of fundamentally differing views? 
Okay, uh, that's a that's an interesting question, a really important one, and I would agree with it in some ways and not in others. Um, so certainly, my suggestion isn't that there should be unanimity uh, at all times on on various complex and controversial issues. Um, uh, there'd be something wrong if if everyone were in agreement on everything uh, as well. Um, uh, there could even be really fundamental things on which there could be um, a, a transitional disagreement while we're sorting things out. And that, that could be a very constructive thing as we realize something new. Um, and I, I would be open even to the possibility of certain kinds of permanent asymmetries within uh, the constitutional order. And it's something that's been proposed in the context of Quebec in various ways, um, possibly other provinces as well, um, uh, that, uh, that may want to engage in the development of different kinds of uh, asymmetries um, in, uh, in exactly how they fit within the, the federation. Um, th those, those wouldn't be the kinds of things I'm concerned about. Um, uh, I mean, I could agree or disagree with a particular asymmetry, but um, the thing I'm really concerned about and that I don't think can be a good thing is if there's a fundamental breakdown on uh, green on what even is a norm or how you go about identifying a constitutional norm or something so that we just can't engage in a discussion about the law in a predictable, somewhat predictable way so that there can be a, an argument at the Supreme Court of Canada um, where uh, where uh, there's, there's an argument where people agree on some terms of that argument. That becomes a real problem. It raises even rule of law issues, frankly, at, at a certain point. Um, if, uh, if the law were to be rendered sufficiently unpredictable uh, that, uh, that governments couldn't act based on it because there's such a, a disagreement in the, the underlying arrangements for it. So um, I think... Um, there's there's some value in um, disagreements certainly, um, but if they reach the point of real cleavages, I think there are reasons to be concerned. Thanks, and Dwight. I mean, Dwight, my I really enjoyed your your talk. My sense is, um, you know, much also depends on, uh, you know, the where the cleavages exist. So it's one thing if legal scholars are, you know, we're sort of incorrigible, right? Um, we live to disagree with one another, and and that can be quite generative. Um, it's you know the matter is quite different if, if, as you're saying, if you are talking about the Supreme Court of Canada or you know the executive that needs to follow some you know semi-authoritative uh, you know account of the Constitution. There, these types of cleavages are, are much more problematic. Okay, um, we have about five minutes left, and I'd like to go to Colleen. Um, you know, Colleen, I think one of the uh, tensions that about patriation that your your paper brought out for me is, and I I really hadn't thought about this tension until you you mentioned it, um, is the way in which, on the one hand, um, you know, state sovereignty, uh, Canadian sovereignty, was an important product of patriation. Um, so on the one hand, you have this sort of full territorial sovereignty, um, as you're saying, uh, at least that's kind of the account. And of course, we recognize the ways in which that's, you know, largely premised on a, a colonial fiction. Um, on the other hand, you have the account of rights, um, you know, rights coming along with sovereignty. And, and I guess what I see there is, you know, sort of simultaneously, the uh, the establishment of some form of territorial sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the UK, but then also um, real constraints on sovereignty, right? In the sense of accepting the charter, accepting indigenous rights, even in this sort of um, fairly modest way as being constraints on state action. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, you know, if, if you've thought about that at all, I think you talk about sovereignty and rights, um, but I wonder if you've thought it, uh, at all about the ways that those two things actually do pull us sort of in different directions, right? And and what that means ultimately um, mm -hmm. for discussions about, you know, what Canadian sovereignty is. Um, I, I've, you know, done a little bit of work in the context of parliamentary sovereignty. And my argument there has been that rights uh, 
you know, diminish parliamentary sovereignty. Um, I, you know, all, and, and also in, you know, talking about indigenous rights, that those, um, that, you know, parliamentary sovereignty was always, uh, that indigenous rights and indigenous sovereignty was always kind of a carve out in terms of the available sovereignty, right? So the most sovereignty you could ever have would be sort of whatever remains once you account for that pre-existing indigenous sovereignty. So just wondering if, if you've um, thought about yeah. that significance of, of those pulling in different directions. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, I'm still working through the ideas in this paper. I'm in the pretty early stages, but I, as you were asking your question, precisely this idea of the shift from parliamentary sovereignty, full sovereignty, which is internal to this idea of or from parliamentary supremacy to constitutional supremacy and the rise of the role of the courts really as a check. We already had it in terms of division of powers, but also moving into a rights domain. Yeah, I think that's a check and it may be that it goes to some of Mary's points about the idea that power is always shared and there shouldn't be a monopoly on power. But I was thinking about rights more in terms of how we need to re we have to expand our conception of rights to take rights into the domain of power structures and systems. And that that then gets us at questions that allows us to potentially use rights as a way to rethink how we govern ourselves and how we govern ourselves in the complexity of multiple sovereignties in terms of various formal levels of government as well as informal governance. So maybe that's not a full answer, but I, I take your point. There's a whole range of constraints on sovereignty. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So yeah, thanks. Well, you never really know when a panel is organized how the individual papers will fit together, you know, especially when you're working several months in advance. But uh, I think, you know, there, there's lots of overlap in, in the papers that were presented today. And uh, so I'm very grateful to all three of you for your comments, um, your presentations and your answers to the questions. And uh, thank you to the audience as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.